Hi everyone and welcome to today's webinar. I'm Susan Moeller from BuzzSumo and we are thrilled to have Michael Brenner, who's the CEO of the Marketing Insider Group, to talk with us today about calculating the ROI of content marketing. So we'll never have to waste money again. Michael, thanks so much for being with us. We're thrilled to have you and looking forward to hearing from you. There was so many questions and we still hear it every single day from executives, you know, is there truly ROI in content marketing? So, so we're going to get through that today. We're going to get into um, actual formulas and calculations that anyone in any business can use. Um, and as Steve mentioned, um, don't feel like you need to, to uh, screen grab or worry about whether you're going to get the slides, you're going to get the recording. I've got a link to this presentation up on SlideShare right here. If you want to go check that out as soon as we're done, I'll, I'll um, include this link at the end of the presentation as well, along with a free gift that uh, that we're going to provide for you. So, so without any further ado, I want to just thank Steve and the folks at BuzzSumo for sponsoring this, and um, really looking forward to to speaking to each of you. And so, without any further ado, let's uh, let's get started. All right, so these are my kids, and and um, I was telling Steve, and I think he already knows uh, that I've got four um, four of these, and. And it's it's uh, it really been kind of an interesting ride. If you're a parent, you know how much kids can really change your life. And and when I was looking at um, uh, you know LinkedIn was just purchased by Microsoft. If those of you who who've heard that news um, just earlier this week, and and my oldest daughter is actually one week older than LinkedIn. So so I really I can I can feel the change that social media has brought into the world of marketing because I have a daughter, my oldest daughter is the exact same age as our oldest commercially viable um, social media network. And then I actually went and I looked at my other kids and, and I have a really strange and serendipitous sort of connection between my kids and some major milestones in the world of digital marketing. Um, all the way on the left hand side there, my, my daughter, my second daughter, um, is about uh, about a month younger than Facebook's launch, so their official launch um, out to the wider public. My son there, just a second from the left, um, his birthday is actually one week away from the launch, the official launch of the iPhone here in the United States. So, so we've got uh, we've got LinkedIn, we've got Facebook, we've got the iPhone launch, and then the the sort of the big head there in the middle, number four, my my crazy my crazy number four son. Um, his birthday is actually uh, just a few days away from the launch of Snapchat. And so he was brought into the world right around the same time as Snapchat. And we're still trying to figure him out. I'm still trying to figure out Snapchat. But anyway, what does all this mean? The point I'm trying to make is that if you have kids or if you know anyone that does, you know that they really change your world. And if you look at, at the age of these children, I don't let them a home alone by themselves. I don't let them cross the street. Um, think of just how young this technology is and the, the dramatic changes that digital, social, mobile technologies have brought, not just into our world overall, but especially into the function of marketing. And so um, I'm going to leave you sort of and start with uh, my sort of mantra in life that I really do believe life is short. And when you look at the amount of change that's happening in the world that we live in, in our business lives and in the fu marketing function overall, um, I really believe that your business life is even shorter. If life is short, your business life is, is even shorter. And so why should we spend time doing things that don't work? Why should we spend time doing the things that are stuck in 20, 25 years ago? Um, especially in this world of digital marketing where everything can be measured. And so the one thing I want everyone to walk away from, the one tip to doing content marketing ROI is to stop doing things that don't actually work. Stop doing the things that you know you can't measure. Stop doing the things that you can measure and don't make an impact on, on, the, on the actual business results that you're trying to drive. So, so that's my one thing. Um, Content marketing ROI is super important because we know that ROI is the number one objective for marketers in 2016. Study after study after study shows that measuring return on investment is the number one challenge and objective for marketers all over the world in all shapes and sizes of companies. It's CMO's greatest challenge. It's B2B marketing greatest challenge, it's B2C marketers greatest challenge, is, is showing and measuring the effectiveness of their marketing activities to the executive team, to their management teams, to the C-suite. And so ROI is super important. And yet when we think about what do most people think about marketing, right? So think about what does your mom believe you do if you're in marketing? And if, if she's like most people, or if you ask, uh, if you have attorneys or doctors um, who are friends that aren't in the business world, ask them what marketing is, and they're going to tell you something 
that sounds a little bit like sales or they're going to tell you something that sounds an awful lot like advertising. And while those are effective things that we need to be thinking about as marketers, they're not all that marketing is. Marketing has a marketing problem because if you ask most people what marketing is, they won't give you an answer that total, totally reflects the things that we need to do. So this is what most people think. They think about the most evil creation in the history of advertising, the autoplay video ad, right? That's what most people think of when they think of marketing, or they think of sales, or they think of banner ads, or they think of, of Super Bowl commercials, right? And marketing is so much more than that, right? So think about banners. Think about the banner ad. This is the first banner ad, 1994. And then this was an, an ad actually by AT&T, telecommunications company, and said, hey, have you ever clicked your mouse right here? Because you will. This was 1994. This banner had a click-through rate of 44%. 44% of all the people that saw this ad clicked through. And, and of course, we know that we don't see 44% click-through rates. Um, and just in the last 15 years, I mean, you can see from 1994 to 2000, we went from 44% to just under 10%. And now in the last uh, 15 years, we've gone from, from just under 10% to, to well under 0.1%, well under 0.1%. Um, 0.08% was, uh, was Comscore's 2015 number. Uh, projections are that we're going to see something like 0.6, um, uh, 0.6 and, or sorry, 0.06 or even 0.05% click-through rates on banner ads, right? So this is what most people think of when they think of marketing. You're more likely to be struck by lightning to give birth to twins, not to die, but to survive a plane crash and to win the Powerball than you are to have someone click on your banner ad. So we live in a world, a digital marketing world, where everything is measurable. And yet, we are spending 20% more year over year on digital, digital banner advertising, digital display. 20% more year over year despite the precipitous decline in click-through rates, despite the fact that you're more likely to be struck by lightning than you are to have someone click on your banner ad. So why are we throwing more money after marketing activities that simply don't work and are completely measurable? So what can we stop doing? If life is short, your business life is shorter, and we need to stop doing something, one area to look at is banner ads. 0.06% click-through rate, 2015, this is double-click. 10% of those clicks are actually by robots or computers. 50% of the clicks on mobile ads are completely accidental. So you're seeing these are measurable marketing activities. Many are marketing activities are not measurable. This is a measurable marketing activity, and yet we're seeing these kind of results. Let's talk about things that aren't as measurable. This is, I'm in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I'm a huge Eagles fan. We're not really big fans of the New England Patriots if you follow the NFL, but I'm going to talk about Gillette Stadium, home of the New England Patriots, right? Home of the New England Patriots, Gillette Stadium. What is the ROI of putting your logo on a stadium? What's the ROI of putting your logo on a golfer's hat or on the side of a bus? I'm not saying that there is an ROI. I'm just saying that there's no way to know what it is. It's very difficult to measure the return on investment of many of the traditional marketing activities that companies are employing, the kinds of things that your mom thinks about when, when you ask her what she thinks marketing is. Um, one of the best videos I have seen, interviews I have seen in years, in my, maybe in my career in marketing. This is not a CMO, this is the CEO of, of app development company Machine Zone. They create um, an app called Mobile Strike, which you may have seen some commercials for. Um, this CEO is uh, considered to be one of the top 10 media buyers in the world. They spend more money buying media than, than almost anyone else in the world. He did this interview at the Recode conference in New York a few weeks ago, and if you just look at the title, it says, Watch Machine Zone CEO Freak Out a Room Full of Media People. Okay, why did he freak them out? Because he said that CEOs and boards will no longer accept marketing that doesn't deliver results. CEOs and boards will no longer accept marketing that doesn't deliver measurable results. Results. He said a lot of other things. He predicted the, the end of brand advertising as we know it. Um, and this is from one of the largest media buyers in the world. And so consumers are feeling like this. And hopefully you can see this animated GIF um, where poor Holly is standing in, in the middle of a storm and gets knocked over by a stop sign. This is how our consumers are feeling. We are no longer 
um, unwilling to put up with ads, we're actually getting angry at the brands that are trying to interrupt our content experiences. And so we need to stop interrupting what people are interested in and be what people are interested in, create what people are interested in. That's the goal of content marketing. Okay, that's the reason we talk about content marketing at all. It's why content marketing is the buzzword and the trend that we've seen. Okay, so this is my favorite tool. It's, it's not a paid endorsement, and Steve knows that. Um, I, I use BuzzSumo every single day and have been for years. Uh, the reason for that is because BuzzSumo tells me um, exactly what I think that my audience is searching for, what they're sharing, um, what topics, what types, what sources, what influencers are driving the conversation in content marketing, a conversation that I'm, I'm very, as you can probably tell, very passionate about. Now let's talk about the, 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 the state of, of content in the world that we live in, right? So you can see just here in content marketing ROI, the topic of today's webinar, um, there were over 500 articles published on content marketing ROI in the last year. And Steve uh, helped to run some of these numbers for me, so I want to thank him for that. Um, those 500 articles were, were shared about 90,000 times. There were over 4,000 articles on marketing ROI more generally. So there's a lot of content being created around content marketing ROI. There's a lot of interest around the topic of content marketing ROI. Now let's look at the likelihood that you are to have your content shared. And again, this is from Steve, so I want to thank him again, um, looking at uh, the top 100 B2B content sites. And what, what Steve's showing here in this data is that only 4% or 4,500 of the 114,000 posts got more than 3,000 shares. So there's, there's a pretty long tail of shares that happen. Um, but what can we learn from this, right? What we can learn, I think, is that um, if we look at the medians, the median for most B2B content, in this case we're talking about B2B, is around 106 shares. The median shares for most B2B content is around 106 shares. For a million random sites over the, over the course of, of, of all of the content that BuzzSumo is looking at, the median is eight. And so the point, the message here is that if you can get eight on your content, you're doing about as good as just about anybody else. If you can get 100 shares on your content, you're doing just about as, as well as, as any site in the B2B space, right? And so think it's not that difficult to create a piece of content that can get shared more than eight times. So, so yes, you could start by looking at this data and say that it's pretty depressing. It's going to be difficult to, to, to justify an investment in content marketing if the average piece of content overall gets eight shares. But we know that you can do better. You know that you can do better. And so that's what we're going to talk about here. Okay? And so here is uh, one of the ways that I use BuzzSumo. Once I figure out the top topics, the top types, I start to look at, okay, here's the Content Marketing Institute, one of the top sources of content marketing advice. What's the top content on their site? All to, edit, to inform my editorial plan. Who are the top influencers in content marketing? And so you can see some of the folks that are influencing the conversation in content marketing here. The way to create content that's going to allow you to get more than eight or more than the median number of shares is to map content to the buyer journey. The buyer journey is nothing more than a series of questions that must be answered. And there's a pretty common process that we follow when we navigate through the buyer journey. Your customers are asking a pretty common set of questions. They want to know what is the thing that you sell? Why is that category of solution important? How do I become effective at employing or deploying that solution? Who sells it? How much is it? And where can I find out more information? These are the questions that in almost every category of product there is, these are the questions that buyers are asking. And what's really important to understand is that there's 100 times more buyers in the early stage than there are in the late. There's about 10 more buyers in the middle stage as there are in the late. So for every single buyer that you might be able to reach today, there's 100 people just starting their journey, asking really simple, basic questions. If you sell cloud computing, they're trying to understand what is cloud computing. And then if they're in the middle stage, how do I deploy cloud computing solutions? So we have to map content to the buyer journey. You can see that um, here with uh, what is content marketing questions, the number one um, or, or one of the most shared pieces of content coming from Content Marketing Institute. You can see um, now we get into t t to how do I deploy content marketing effectively. And you can see a couple of articles that I wrote um, around uh, hot tools or examples or 17 content marketing tips for any size budget. So you can see how we go from what is to how to, to who does it and how much is it. 
simply mapped to the buyer journey. All right, so this is a content marketing ROI webinar, so let's get into the math, right? So warning, there is some math ahead. Um, I was an English literature major, so math is not my first, um, my first strength or strong suit, but, uh, but as we get in and, and try to understand the return on investment in content marketing, we have to get into the math. And I, I'm gonna tell you, don't be scared away. Um, some of the formulas that I'm going to present to you um, are so intuitive you're going to hit yourself in the head and wonder why didn't we think of this before. <laughs> um, and so, but I'm going to try to walk through in a logical framework the ways that you can calculate 10 steps, 10 formulas that you can use to calculate content marketing ROI. Before we get there, it's important to understand we've talked about the, the importance and the impact that digital marketing, mobile technologies, the web have had on our world and specifically on marketing overall. Digital marketing programs, content marketing programs are assets, financial assets that have value that can be quantified and with a significant consistent investment that value grows over time. Content marketing programs are financial assets with quantifiable value that with a consistent investment will grow over time. So here's just a quick visual example of that. This is actually a client um, who invested um, a very small but very consistent amount of investment in content marketing. Each month they, they published um, a couple of dozen articles. Each month they published a couple of dozen articles, about two or three articles a week. Okay, two or three articles a week. Every single month they didn't increase their investment in content marketing over time. They created a consistent amount of content each month over time. And what you can see here is that despite that consistent investment in content in the green bar, they started to see an, an increasing return on that single investment, an increasing return in the form of page views in the blue bars over time. What's really interesting though is that because their conversion rates, um, they were focused on optimizing for conversion, they saw a similar increase, almost accelerating increase in the number of leads they were generating from content marketing, despite the fact that they didn't increase their investment over time. It was a steady, consistent investment that drove an accelerating return on page views and an accelerating return on leads. Content marketing programs are assets that have value that grows over time. Okay, what is ROI? ROI, very simply, is a math calculation. It's return divided by investment. I'm gonna break that down a little further. ROI is revenue minus investment divided by investment. So I want you to think about what's interesting about this calculation. We often forget that ROI is a math calculation. We often think ROI equals revenue. No, it's revenue minus investment divided by investment. What's interesting about this calculation is investment shows up twice. So I want you to go back to the one thing I started this webinar with, right? Life is short, your business life is shorter. The best way to drive a return on investment in marketing programs is to stop doing things that don't deliver a return. If investment shows up twice, it means that a simple or small but measurable change on the investment side of this equation will drive a higher return on investment. What I mean is that if you do more with less, you'll deliver a return on investment. Or you can do the same with less and deliver a return on investment. Because investment shows up twice, if you simply stop doing one thing that you're investing in that doesn't deliver a result, and you deliver the same result for a smaller investment, you're going to define an ROI. So this is, this is where we're starting to get to the answers, and I'll get more specific as we go into how to define content marketing ROI. Okay, 60 to 70% of marketing content goes completely unused. This is from Serious Decision. 60 to 70% of the marketing content your company creates goes completely unused. Why do we create all that content? Why do we create stuff that no one wants? And so I think we know the answer. It's the boss's fault, right? We can easily point the finger and say it's the head of sales or it's the CEO and, and it's, it's the, the product people that want to create all this stuff, the brochures that we know no one ever wants. I think it's easy for us to point the finger. I think that we're we're accountable. We have to hold ourselves accountable for the things we create. Life is short. Your business life is shorter, and so we need to stop doing the things that we know won't have an impact. That means we have to push back a little bit, right? And so we need to show folks that are asking us that, that you know, we need to create a brochure that nobody wants or a piece of collateral, collateral that we know no one's going to read, that by creating something no one wants, we are wasting money. 
and this waste is a massive number. E-consultancy calls this a hundred billion with a B, one hundred billion dollar problem. And imagine what we could do if we could turn that hundred billion dollars into an investment in customer-centric content marketing. Remember, content marketing are programs that are assets that have real value that grows over time. So we need to push back and, and you know, people always then ask me, well, how do we do that? Well, I think it's pretty simple. We, we ask, why does this thing you're asking for matter? What's the impact that you think it's going to have? And how are we going to measure that impact? If you can't get an answer for these three questions, why does this matter? What's the impact? And how can we measure it? Then it's probably a good um, idea to push back. It's probably a good idea to point to something that does matter, that will drive impact, and can be measured. That's content marketing. Okay, so this is my simple definition of content marketing. Content marketing is the overlap between what brands typically produce and what your customers are looking for. And what do I mean by that? This is what we generally, normally have traditionally done. We, we create stuff. It's our natural business instinct to want to talk about who we are, what we sell, and why we're better. So in, in the end, we're basically telling people that we're great and we're proud of our companies and our products, and that's okay. The problem is, is that there's a massive amount of that kind of messaging that doesn't overlap whatsoever at all with what your customers are actually looking for. Now let's jump to the other side of the equation. Some of your customers only are interested in pictures of, of puppies and kittens and babies, and so you know that's not going to help drive your business forward, and so there is an element of content that you probably don't want to create, but there is a large amount of overlap between what you typically produce, the stuff you know, and the things that your customers are interested in. So content marketing requires empathy. How do you explain the importance of empathy to executives who don't have any? Right? How do you explain the importance of stop the sales message and the promotional message because it doesn't overlap with your customer's interest? That's the importance of empathy. How do you explain that? Well, there is no way to explain empathy to an executive that doesn't have any, but we, what you can explain is that by acting empathetically, you can show them the money. And that's what we're going to do here. So the number one way to improve marketing ROI, this is my favorite trick. Go into whatever CRM software application your company uses. Uh, maybe you're using marketing automation software that measures the effectiveness of marketing tactics and campaigns. If you have any marketing automation or CRM software application, go into a report that shows as many or all of your marketing activities with any result, whether it's leads or inquiries or revenue or sales or if you have even return on investment because you're tracking budget, that would be the most ideal. But most, most of us only know some sort of a measure like page views or leads. Run a report that shows all of your marketing activities and rank it from low to high. Now, I, I, when I present in public, I often see CMOs like start to turn white because of the fear that they have over the number of campaigns and tactics and activities that are going to show zero results, zero trackable results. Um, this is one of the easiest ways to figure out how to take the things that are no longer working or are unmeasurable and to shift that investment into content marketing. So take the things that that don't just deliver low results, but take the things that deliver zero results and transfer that investment into content marketing. So building the business case for change starts with an understanding that content marketing allows you to reach, engage, and convert buyers you would have never reached if you didn't create customer-centric content. The business case for content marketing is that you will reach, engage, and convert customers you would have never reached if you didn't do content marketing. And the audience of people that you can reach is significantly larger than the one you're already reaching. So how do we measure the ROI of content marketing? These are the steps I'm going to walk through. You can quantify the reach, engagement, conversion, and retention. Um, you can quantify the reach, engagement, conversion, and retention of content marketing. Uh, and we're going to show you how to do that. Okay, what do you spend on paid search because you don't rank organically? That's number one. What do you spend on paid search because you don't rank organically. Quick story, Lily Lepine, she's the former content marketing manager at Capgemini. She just recently left to, 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 to take her career in a whole new direction, building on the success that she developed uh, here at Capgemini. And they were asking, what do we spend on paid search because we don't rank organically? 
what they found was that 70% of all the search that happened in the cloud computing space, something really important to them, was happening in the organic space. Only 30% was happening where they were spending their money on paid search. So why were they spending money on the 30% when they could spend a little bit less money on the 70%, reaching a larger audience with content marketing? They created a site called Content Loop, content-loop.com. Um, they use LinkedIn-sponsored updates, uh, licensed content from, from publishers, uh, well-known publishers, to reach the exact right group of people. And what they found was that they had a million visitors in their first year. They were getting 3,000 new followers a week on LinkedIn. They were generating high-quality leads and return on investment, and I'm going to show you how they did that. So a LinkedIn-sponsored update would show up to a targeted prospect. That person would land on their content loop website, read an article about enterprise collaboration or cloud computing or whatever it was, and then they did something really subtle and really cool. They said, hey, if you like this article, maybe you want to connect with Remco, our practice leader on cloud computing. And so it was a really soft and really subtle conversion opportunity for them. Hey, you've just been informed about a topic that you are interested in on our brand experience. Maybe you want to connect with someone on our sales team. And so these connections drove millions of dollars of new sales for Capgemini in the first year. Almost unexpectedly, millions of dollars in new sales from contentloop.com. So what's the ROI of reach? What's the ROI of this early stage awareness generating type of activity? Well, quite simply, it's the value that you were spending in paid search applied to that organic search, right? And so if you imagine that, that Capgemini was spending $2 on a cost per click basis in paid search, they were able to generate a million page views. Well, you can see that that's, that's going to be $2 million, $2 million in value. Now, if they were able to get 50% of that traffic from specifically from organic search, then you can start to see how that would drive a million dollars in value. You could do the same thing for unbranded search. Unbranded search traffic is often 10 to 100 to 1,000 times higher than the amount of branded search. What do I mean by that? At SAP, we found that the number of people coming to our website, 100% um, of them were typing SAP or product names into their browser. Um, the size of the audience of people that weren't finding our website but in related product categories like big data and analytics and business intelligence and ERP was 3,000 times larger. And so if we could reach them, we could use the same CPC number, $2 a click or whatever you might be using multiplied by the amount of unbranded search traffic that was coming to our site that had never come before to get the value of the reach. Okay, let's talk about engagement. This is a mattress company called, called uh, Caspers, and they have a great blog called Pillow Talk where they, they explain ways that you can get a better night's sleep or how to cure your hangover. Um, they're a mattress company, so they talk about sleep. And yet what they found was that there was this massive audience of people who were obsessed with sleep. So they went and created Van Winkles. Van Winkles is a site for the sleep obsessed. Sleep better, wake sharper, and get more done. They create um, really interesting articles about the sleep obsessed culture, and they're driving specifically for one objective, subscribers. Why do they see so much value in subscribers? Why is a brand, a mattress company, that already has a corporate blog, why did they go out and build a publisher-like experience to focus on subscribers? Because subscribers have value. Subscribers is a measure of engagement. What's the value of a social share? I have no idea. But I can value a subscriber. It's a measure of engagement. It's a measure of a volume of people reached. It's a, it's a small or potentially slight conversion. It also can help you track retention. Subscribers have value. Subscribers are nine times more likely to convert than non-subscribers. This is from research done while, we, while I was at NewsCred. Sub subscribers are nine times more likely to convert than non-subscribing visitors to your website. So what's the value of a subscriber? This is probably the easiest calculation here. All you need to do is take the revenue that your company has ever generated from, an e from your email database divided by the size of your email database. Revenue from your email database divided by the size of your email database. So you can imagine if you had $10 million in sales last year after emailing to 400,000 people, that simple math comes to $25. If you were able to generate a, a content marketing platform that delivered 10,000 subscribers in a year, 
the value of those subscribers would be $250,000. Subscribers have value, subscribers convert at a much higher rate than non-subscribed visitors to your website. Okay? Now let me tell you just briefly my story from SAP. So I was asked to, to lead content marketing when the CEO of our company stood on a stage in front of 20 or 30,000 people and said that technology drives innovation and competitive advantage. Technology drives innovation and competitive advantage. And he sat down and he turned to the CMO and he said, you know what, I think this message of thought leadership over product messaging really resonates. Why don't we deliver that message on our website? And so that was the problem that I was asked to solve. I went and I found that there were the number of people typing SAP Cloud into their browser versus SAP Cloud Computing, as I mentioned, was almost 3,000 to 1. 3,000 more people were typing Cloud Computing in their web browser than SAP Cloud. Now, how many of that 3,000 people were coming to our website? 1 in 10,000. Not 1%, but 0.01%. 0.01% of our web traffic came from that 3,000 uh, um, times larger audience. So we were talking to ourselves. All the people coming to SAP's website knew who we were, what we sold. They, they were already probably talking to a salesperson or they were already a customer. We were talking to ourselves on our website and yet this math didn't help drive change in the organization. So I was banging my head against the table. And so after realizing that math wouldn't work, I moved to fear. The power of fear can drive change in an organization. So I, I, I presented this story to our sales team. Imagine we show up first in Google. Imagine we own the category like L'Oreal does with Makeup.com. Imagine we own the target audience like, like Adobe does with CMO.com. Imagine creating a marketing platform, a content marketing platform that attracts new buyers like American Express does with Open Forum, the largest source of new leads for their small card division the largest source of new leads for their small card division. And so I started to see some interest and some desire for change, but I had to go one step further. I had to stoke their fears of competition. So I typed in big data. Big data is a huge product uh, solution area for SAP. And I showed them that IBM shows up, Oracle shows up, McKinsey shows up, but SAP didn't show up. And so finally, the sales team came back to our marketing colleagues and said, you know, we need to focus on developing a content marketing platform to reach folks in the early stages. Now, we had no budget, but I did notice that we had an advertising campaign that was running. And if you go to sap.com forward slash run better, you would, at the time, in 2012, you would have seen um, a landing page that, that I knew spent uh, uh, cost about $200,000 to develop had a 99% bounce rate. Um, when I asked about what conversions it drove, I was told this was an awareness campaign. Zero search traffic, none, not a single, single visitor came from search and no social shares. Okay, so this was a advertising landing page costing $200,000 where almost everyone bounced immediately, drove no conversions, drove zero search traffic and had absolutely no social shares. So I proposed to the head of advertising that we create a content marketing program at half the cost. And instead of a 99% bounce rate, we could deliver something like 70%. And instead of no conversions or, or, or inability to track conversions, we could deliver thousands of conversions. That half the traffic could come from search. The 10% of the content would, or, or of the traffic from our website would come from social shares. And so we developed SAP Digitalist Magazine, to help executives understand how technology drives innovation. And we had ROI from day one. I developed this platform on, on behalf of our advertising team at half of the budget that they were spending to create advertising landing pages. We delivered a return on investment from day one by simply doing the same thing for less money. Doing the same thing for less money. But the thing that we developed had legs. It had a greater amount of, of engagement with readers because we were creating customer-centric content to help executives understand how technology drives innovation. We had conversions, almost a thousand in year one. We had search traffic at 50%. We had social shares at 10% of the traffic. 10% of the traffic came directly from unpaid social sharing of the content that we were publishing. 
And this is this is um, of SAP Digitalist magazine today. So this is their their managing editor who took over for me, and and she sent out this chart a couple of weeks ago, and it shows how SAP Digitalist magazine gets more engagement than Fortune Fast Company, Business Insider, and TechCrunch. So you can look at average time spent on the site, average pages per visit, and bounce rate. They're now down at 53% of bounce rate relative to Fortune. That's that's uh, at 71, 80, and and higher. So, so two to three times the level of engagement happening. This is Krista Rui, who's now running SAP Digitalist Magazine. Why would she be sending this out to her community to let people know that this website is now getting more engagement than publishers? Because they're monetizing the traffic. They're monetizing the traffic by selling ads to partners. Content marketing programs are assets that have real value that you can quantify and that grows over time. So what was the ROI of conversion for SAP? Well, we had 1,000 leads, and you can see some complicated math here around conversions to MQL at 3%, and sales accepted lead at 50%, and sales qualified lead at 50%, and a 40% close rate, and $180,000 average selling price. $180,000 average sales price. So you could say that the ROI of this program was 4.4x, right? So we took the revenue minus the investment even though the investment was almost zero because we had saved $100,000. But even if you, if you increase the amount of difficulty here on the equation, 4.4x ROI. How many marketing programs do you know of that can deliver a 4.4x return on investment? And that's just looking at the leads. That's just looking at the leads, not looking at the traffic we reached, the engagement we secured, the subscribers that we were able to develop. Um, and now the ad revenue that SAP is selling on their site. So, so reach, engagement, conversion, and retention. Right. So are we feeling good? Are we feeling good about the ROI of content marketing? Well, think about retention. It's six to seven times cheaper to keep an existing customer than it is to acquire a new one. We've all seen this research, right? Six to seven times cheaper to keep an existing customer than to acquire a new one. A 5% increase in retention can deliver a 95% increase in ROI. One of the best ways to determine the ROI of content marketing is to apply it to retention. And so here's a quick story. This is my friend Shane Jordan. Shane's a digital marketing manager at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Alabama, a healthcare company in the state of Alabama. And what they showed, because their customers have to log in to get access to their website, Shane came up with a theory. His theory was that if they presented customer-focused, valuable content to their customers, that that would drive conversion and upsells, that it would drive retention, retention of existing customers, and higher revenue from existing customers. And what he found was that the people that logged into his website, the customers that consumed this content, were two times more likely to stay as customers, two times more likely to spend more as customers. So two to three times more likely to stay and to spend more as customers. So content marketing can deliver return on investment when you look at retention. One way to do that, so this is, this is just a couple of different ways. You can look at the lifetime value of your customers. You can look at the retention rate of your customers. You can look at the revenue per customer for content consuming versus non-content consuming customers. So if you have a healthcare company, or if you have a financial services company, or if you're in any way able to track logged in customers who are consuming content versus logged in customers who don't, and you present content marketing programs, you'll be able to show two to three times higher retention and two to three times higher revenue per customer with content marketing. All right, so I know I ran through a lot of this information really quickly. Like I said, these slides will be available. The recording will be available. If you just get one thing out of all this, life is short. Your business life is even shorter. The time we have to make an impact is so small, and yet the best way to do it is just to stop doing stuff that doesn't matter, just to stop doing stuff that doesn't make an impact. Stop doing stuff that you're not proud of and start doing the things that you can show have a measurable impact on your business. And so with that, here's my free gift to you. So this is from the book, The Content Formula, the 10 steps and the 10 calculations to developing your own content marketing ROI. Again, we'll share this link with you so you don't have to copy it now, uh, but it's, it's bit.ly forward slash content dash formula. 
And then, as I mentioned, these slides can be found here. Steve's going to send out a copy of this deck and a recording as well. And so, without any further ado, Steve, hopefully I didn't uh, I didn't either bore people or run too quickly <laughs> the material, but I'm going to turn it over to you, hopefully, for some questions. Yeah, that's great. No, we've got a number of questions coming in. That's fantastic, Michael. Thank you. And we, I need to make sure we do more content marketing, looking at issues like retention and uh, and churn. Churn's always an issue in a in a SaaS business like ours, and uh, mm -hmm. just being able to do more around content for that could help us significantly, I think. Um, but a couple of the questions that have that come in. One the first question was, uh, you talked about 60 to 70% of content going unused. People were just asking, where does that stack come from, and what does unused mean? Does it mean simply not seen or not acted upon? Yeah, I, you know, I, I feel like that's the most overused stat in all of marketing. Um, the, the other one is I think the serious decisions also, it's serious decisions that did that, that research. They're also the one um, that showed that 70% uh, of the buyer journey is complete before your customers reach out to vendors for a price. Um, and there's their corporate executive board um, has done some similar research. But if people are looking for that stat, it's serious decisions. So if you just search serious decisions, 60, 70% of content unused, you'll find the source. What that stat means, this is important, it is not content that gets created and published and doesn't perform well. So in your media and research, let's say it's not content that only gets two shares or, four or five shares. It's content that gets requested, created, and never published at all. It never gets a chance to perform. And it, it, it almost sounds crazy, right? People are like, wait, you mean companies spend 60 to 70% of their, of their content budget on content that gets created and never published? And the answer is yes. And so I've seen a lot of resistance to this stat, and I've done content audits for, um, I've done really detailed content audits for five enterprise size companies. And the answer that came back was 60%, 64%, 66% and 68% of the content they requested, that their teams requested of agencies, of internal people, of external partners to get created, and then it never actually got used in a campaign or a program or a website. Yeah, and so it, it's, it's cra it sounds insane, and yet when you start to think about what happens inside a lot of companies, the sales guy wants a brochure that you know will, no one will ever look at. And so you go and create it, and you hand it to the sales guy, and he never uses it. Or the web team asks for a web page to be updated, and by the time you update the web page, the product is discontinued. Or, you know, so when you start to really think about what's behind this, it makes sense. Um, and I think it happens simply because we don't push back. Yeah, no, that's an incredible stat, and that's really helpful to clarify. But we certainly don't do that at Buzzsumo. We don't, we don't, don't have <laughs> enough money to, to pay for content that's not used. But um, another question here, someone's saying, um, do you recommend uh, creating a retargeting audience for every blog post? If you want to promote uh, and push your blog post out there, do you recommend creating a retargeting audience for each blog post? Um, so I would say, you know, I, one of the things that I, I help my clients with understanding is the content marketing maturity curve. And, and what I mean by that is, you know, for me it starts with, you know, building a business case for content marketing, creating a content marketing platform, um, and, and then mapping content to the buyer journey, and then sharing content on social, you know, earned media, social media, and then paying to promote the content. So I would say that retargeting is a relatively mature kind of a conversation. Um, but, you know, so the question I would ask is, I would test retargeting and paid distribution against the investment in creating more content. And what I mean by that is I did this for my own site. So if you you know marketing insider group, you know, I have to kind of I have to kind of test my own theories as a consultant. <laughs> and and so you know I tested, I create, I you know I, I create uh, as much content as I as I possibly can. And then I tested different means of, of paid promotion. I looked at Outbrain and Taboola and LinkedIn and Twitter and Facebook boosting. Um, I was doing retargeting through Outbrain and I believe Facebook. Uh, and what I found was that in measuring cost per subscriber, cost per subscriber, um, right, because on a paid promotional campaign, you're, you're buying on a pay-per-click. So, so I knew I could optimize pay-per-click, but I wanted to see would it dr drive subscribers for me. And so what I found was that in a, an investment in a piece of content, 
would provide more return than an investment in a, in a retargeted um, sort of paid promotion. That's not true for many of my clients. Now, you know, I talked about Content Loop from Capgemini. They're spending and monetizing every single dollar they spend on LinkedIn sponsored updates. And so I think uh, for some companies, the answer is really you have to test it. And, and somebody else, and that's really useful, and somebody else has asked you, which is in a similar sort of question, they're saying, we promote our content on Facebook. We can get 1,700 likes quite easily, but that's only translating into 64 unique visits to our site. And is, right. is that what you would expect? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think Facebook is, is really um, something where you almost have to pay to get, to get access to the audience. And then the question becomes, you know, I, I, I would always say the one thing to look at when you, when you look at paid promotion for, of content is the cost per engagement, not the cost per visitor. And what I mean by engagement, you can look at an engaged visitor, maybe a repeat visitor. An engaged visitor for me would be either someone that spends about the same amount of time on your website as an organic search visitor. Um, it's really difficult to buy those on, on Facebook. Because a lot of times the traffic you can, you can buy on Facebook, it just simply isn't as engaged as somebody that has found their way to your website on their own. And so um, there are, like I said, there are platforms. I, you know, I've certainly optimized some outbrain spend for people where we were able to get it and filter using retargeting down to an audience of people that were coming in and engaging. Um, but I would say don't chase cost per click. Don't chase low cost per clicks. Chase um, high engaged visitors and the cost that it takes to achieve that. Okay. Another question that's going here is about how much branding should be on content marketing. Um, they were saying on the, the site that you showed, it's got SAP on it. I mean, I, I think obviously Open Forum is an interesting example of that, but, but how much branding do you need on your content marketing? Yeah, the answer is it depends. So I'll, I'll say there's two, there's two decisions um, in almost like a two by two box. One is um, how branded and the other one is how, um, should it be on domain or off domain of your company's site? Um, and so I think the answer for most people is an on domain, lightly branded experience. And what I mean by that is basically a corporate blog. <laughs> so think of it as like, you know, yourcompany.com forward slash blog or blog.yourcompany.com. Um, and there's different considerations there. But, but slightly unbranded, and the reason I think that's important is because it then tells your audience who maybe isn't ready for a branding message or isn't ready to, to have your logo thrown in their face that you're, you're focused on value for them, not on promoting or selling a product. So I think that's the right answer for some people. However, there are great examples like um, adobecmo.com, which is completely off domain and, and, and fairly subtly branded. Um, then there's American Express Open Forum, which started off domain and heavily branded and has moved um, actually now on domain. So it's now part of American Express's web experience. You know, there's, there's different answers for different companies depending on the situation. But like I said, I think the answer for most is to think about it like your corporate blog, um, you know, consistently branded but not overly branded. Um, on domain, and the reason on domain is important is because there's just built-in search authority. Okay, that's great. Thanks for that, Michael. Another one here which I'm personally interested in is someone saying, you know, I've been told I've got to create 2,000 plus Word articles because it's good for SEO, but I find clients hate long articles. Um, you know, what sort of balance do you recommend and do you have a view on sort of long form content versus short form content? Yeah, I, I mean, I think, um, and I, actually, I think you've done some research, so maybe you can help, you can <laughs> clarify what, what I'm going to say. But, um, you know, I've got two friends, a guy named Lee Oden and a guy named. Um, uh, Andy Crestadina, who both sort of say the same thing in a slightly different way. The, the way that they answer that question is just create the best answer on the internet. And, and like I said, they both ha can kind of lay claim to that insight. Um, what they mean is that if you can answer a question better than anyone else in 700 words, then you don't need to spend another 1,300 words just or 300 words just trying to fill in this you know, somewhat arbitrary requirement to get to 2,000. Um, if a 2,000 word article is going to be the best answer that you can to a customer question, then, you know, hey, don't even stop at two. Go, you go up to, you know, keep going. Yeah. Um, but the, the, the objective should be to, to pr create the best answer that you can for your customers. Um, and, and I think that, uh, you know, focusing too much on specific word counts is, is really playing to the Google 
um, sort of uh, algorithm and not really focusing enough on customer okay, value. Okay, yeah. Kim really liked that answer, so that's good. Yeah, I've done quite a lot of research on it, and I can tell you that on average, so you've got to be careful about averages, but on average, long-form content gets more shares, and it certainly gets a lot more links. I think yes. that's only because... Um, on average, it's harder to write long form content and there's a lot of poor quality short form content which drags the averages down. So I think you have to be cautious. But um, I think Leon's point about be the best answer is, is absolutely the right thing. I mean, people want to get to the best answer. I think there is some evidence that some of the best answers are comprehensive answers. And I know people like Neil Patel write the comprehensive way to do something, etc. And it's long form, it's comprehensive. Yeah. And there's some evidence that people link to the comprehensive answers. So it partly depends on what you're trying to do. That said, there's the IFL Science site. If you know the IFL Science site, I think they're brilliant at taking one image or one video to explain a concept, and they get tons and tons of shares and links. Um, and their content is always really short form. But what they do is they work hard to get one image or one graph or one video to explain a concept. And so if you're looking to, for ways to do short form content, I think the IFL Science site is a really good way of looking at that. So, um, yeah, I think the, the jury is out. But if you're doing a, a long form comprehensive answer, that can get more links there, for example. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, somebody asked me, is there a single formula to show content ROI or is it different for every business? Uh, and I suppose it depends on your objectives, really. But if you want to pick up on that one. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it really starts, you know, a lot of people jump to the return on investment question without defining their objective first. Um, and, and like I said, I think in the, you know, in the, in the slides, a lot of people think equate return on investment to revenue which, you know, they're not necessarily the same thing. If, if revenue is not the objective, then revenue is not the best way to define ROI. Um, so, yeah, I think it does depend on business objective number one. I would, I would state that the business objective should be something like reach, engage, convert, or retain, or awareness, engagement, revenue, and or retention. Um, so, you know, think about it in those terms. Um, however, as I, as I, again, as I said in the, in the presentation, subscribers really relate to almost all four of those stages. And so um, there's been a lot of buzz in the content marketing industry for the past 12 months about the focus on subscriptions for two reasons. Subscribers have value, which I've already you know, sort of restated three times, but also subscribers are a great, great way to optimize a content marketing program. So you know, should you do a retargeted paid promotional uh, content um, uh, buy? Well, I don't know. Does it drive subscribers? Or should you change the color of your homepage from red to blue? I don't know. Does it help subscription conversion? Like, it's a great way to, to optimize uh, your digital experience, your content marketing program, and every subscriber that you gain hopefully and optimize into has value. So that would be my my sort of answer, even though the answer really is it depends. Yeah, no, I would agree with you. And I think the other thing there is it's got to be data driven. I mean, lots of people make assumptions uh, about things. Um, and it seems to me it, it's not really about making assumptions or having a hunch about something. You need cold, hard data. And I think um, often even when I just, just simply use Buzzsumo and put our domain and see, okay, what content's performing the best? Or I look at Google Analytics, what's getting shares, what's getting links, etc. You can review that for your site. You can review you, certainly for shares and links for other people's sites as well to see what's working. So I think you have to, to have a look at that uh, in terms of the data and be data driven. There, there are so many questions. I apologize. We're not going to get through them all today, but I'll maybe pick up a couple more. Uh, someone just said, what's the most important metric to measure for content marketing? I think that does depend on your goal as, as Michael said, through the different stages of the buyer journey, are you generating leads, conversions, obviously revenues ultimately. It. Someone's thrown in the, the perennial question, are list posts, do list posts deliver the best return on investment on your blog? Then if you have a view on that, Michael, because the world is still full of list posts. I, you know, uh, people love to bash list posts and, and the bottom line is they're easy to consume as a consumer, right? I love them because I can easily and quickly get the answers that I need to, what are the top three ways to do something? And so um, I, I don't think there's any hard answer to what kind of article gives the highest return. Um, it's a platform that delivers the return. And then, it, and then the real question is, are you answering your buyer's questions in an effective way? And list posts are a really effective way to do that. Yeah, we, we do research after research and list posts are the top performing, both in terms of interestingly shares and links, list posts. And, people yeah. really like them. I think there's a promise, as you say, that they're going to be scannable, easy to read for example. Yep. And I see sites like socialmediaexaminer.com, if you put that into Buzzsumo, you'll see that virtually all of their top posts are list posts or their how-to posts. And how-to posts yes. be another format that works well because it, it delivers value to people in terms of knowing how to do something. Um, That's right. 
I apologize people because I've got loads more questions here. We will try and get back to you with answers to all of them, but I apologize today because we're coming up to the, the half past the hour. Um, but I just wanted to say thank you so much for Michael. It's been really useful, loads of great insights there. And by the fact that I've still got a dozen or more questions that I haven't been able to get to, I apologize people that we've not got to those questions. And I say we will try to answer them separately for you. But I hope it's been interesting. I hope you've taken some value from it. And again, thank you very much, Michael, for your input today. Um, and everyone enjoy the rest of your days uh, wherever you happen to be. But thank you again for your time. Take care, everyone. Thanks, Steve. Thanks. Thanks.